Um, so, morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting me to, to the organizers. Let me not be rude. But I was going to say, I think most of us certainly come into uh, the economic world either through, uh, because we've done some economics or something in the financial sector. I think when you deal with financial regulations, and in fact tax policy as well, you kind of realize it's not only for one particular profession, that you've got to be an economist, you've got to have done uh, something financial. Uh, it, it, it's a, it's, those are really multidisciplinary areas of work. You need legal people, you need uh, accountants, you need economists, financial analysts. And I guess that makes the whole area of financial sector regulation quite complex. In fact, um, I'm pretty certain that when you had the global financial crisis, uh, at least I can say that you were born then, but you may have probably been in, well, in primary school. Okay. Um, how many of you remember the financial crisis in 2008? Okay. Now, that was quite an earth-shattering event, if ever there was one. Really led to real paradigm shift in thinking about financial regulation. And quite importantly, I think, reminded the world about what happened in the 1930s. And reminds us that maybe every 20, 30 years, we forget about some earth-shattering event that happened 20 years ago. And for 30, 10, 20 years, we sail on until the same thing occurs. So we don't learn the lessons from history. So you also need to have a sense of history about this crisis, some perspective that we are human, and there are real human foibles that uh, we fall for um, when you look at the financial sector. So taking a step back, um, as I said, Around 2008, I don't think there was a single course in South Africa at any university which offered a course on financial regulations. I may be wrong, but I don't think they did. And even if they did, it would be just from a very narrow perspective. It would be the law department. It might be, certainly if you're in a bank, you might have been taught about Basel I or Basel II. Uh, but you couldn't really get... Uh, a sense for where, where or how to regulate or any real studies on financial sector regulation. Or indeed, why do we regulate anything? In fact, as you get through university and you learn about free trade and you look at institutions, the whole issue becomes that government gets in a way. Why does it regulate? Uh, and really, the approach coming into 2008 was government needs to regulate very lightly, okay? Uh, that there are just major uh, abuses that can take place, and that's what you are trying to regulate about. Um, and that in itself is a big philosophical discussion, but it's not for today, okay? So coming into 2008, if you look at South Africa, what type of regulation did we have? It looks like certainly, um, uh, was it what, Andrew, the Nell Commission, or what was it, in the 90s, that set up the FSB, eh? Is it, I've forgotten the name, okay. But it doesn't look like we really regulated our institutions uh, too strictly, to the extent that they were regulated. Uh, it was just the South African Reserve Bank which regulated banks. Uh, uh, but if you were asset managers, if you were insurance companies, um, I'm not even sure at what point they began to be regulated. A lot of these institutions could just evolve. They were seen as businesses, as ordinary businesses. But somewhere, uh, with all things money, and I don't know how many of you have followed VBS, and certainly Kuben can deal with it, you'll see that you have bank failures. A few years ago, we had African Bank, and when these things happen, then obviously everybody's asking questions. 
um, who should have been watching? Why did this happen? Uh, did the Reserve Bank, okay, it found out about it, or, there's, or the banking supervisors found out about the problem, why didn't they know earlier? Did they do what they were supposed to do? Okay, lots of questions happen. And I think that, I, 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 and, and I want to get back to 2008 in a second. Um, lots of these questions got asked because up to 2008, the kind of approach that was taken worldwide was that you need very light touch regulation. And largely to the extent that financial institutions were regulated, it was, it was mainly around the banking sector with much lighter forms in insurance, asset management, and so on. But to the extent that even the banking sector was regulated, it focused on the prudential. Now, what do we mean by prudential? We mean that you just looked at whether the institution was financially healthy. Can the institution deliver on its promise? So if you look at the financial sector, many of your financial institutions, and let's start with banks, it's about making a promise to their customers. You go, you open a bank account, you deposit uh, maybe a thousand rands, um, and then you expect whenever you feel like, um, in three months' time, you need that thousand rands, uh, you hope there's a bit, it's grown a little bit by way of interest, and you expect the bank to be able to give you your thousand rands and perhaps a bit more. What if the bank is unable to give you your thousand rands? Then you have a real problem, okay? Because firstly, the bank has broken its promise to you. The promise has been that you leave your money with us, you can take it whenever you like, as agreed. Okay, if you put it into a fixed deposit for six months, you will get it in six months' time. But normally, if it's an ordinary deposit, you'll get that money immediately. So, you're, so in most countries, you just had regulation to make sure that the banks were safe and they were able to deliver on a promise to give you back your money. What do you think would happen if you find out that the bank uh, suddenly says, mm, um, uh, can you come tomorrow? You go tomorrow, mm, mm, can you come next week? What do you think will happen? You know, you start complaining, other customers start complaining, and before you know it, it happens very quickly, you have a bank run. And everyone who's got a deposit, you know, starts rushing to the bank to try and get back their deposits, their savings. And you have a bank run. Now, we're not dealing with banking here, but you know that any bank when it takes your money, it creates money by lending out to people. You have a multiplier effect, and no bank will keep, uh, you know, all the money of the depositors and in a safe. The money, and, and that's the role of the banking system, is to intermediate, and it takes from those who save, and it lends out. It's a very important economic function, okay? And for that reason, and I'm not going to go into the economic function, but it's quite important that the bank is able to meet its promise. Yet if everybody rushed to get their deposits, no bank will be able to pay out all the depositors. Okay? Because the money is taken from you, it's lent to somebody else, those people may have bought a house, they are paying back their uh, monthly amounts, um, and somewhere the bank has done its sums, it's worked out just how much it can lend, how leverage is it going to be, to use the jargon, etc. So your regulators focused on how sound the institution was, okay? Um, come the 2008, and you have the so-called subcrime crisis, which is not probably the reason, but just a trigger, and a major bank goes bust. And that's the problem that you have, is that when, you, when a bank goes bust, you have what's called a systemic crisis, it spreads. So if FNB were to collapse today, many people, for example, uh, 
may, may have their funds in one bank, but they also make loans from other banks. And what, what happens is when one major bank crashes, there's a risk that all the other major banks will crash. And these banks are then called SIFIs, okay, S-I-F-I. If you want to sound intelligent and that you really know the area, just say, ask, is that bank a SIFI? Okay. It stands for systemically important financial institutions. So what happened was you had Lehman that went down and before that Bear Stearns in the US. And when that, that bank folded, it really forced the US to intervene with the so-called TARP program um, where government pumped in billions, trillions actually, to try and salvage the banking system. And if you looked at that crisis, not only did it impact on the US, but with a small lag of within a year, we suffered from a financial crisis, sorry, from a recession in South Africa. So though our banking sector was safe, we, we still suffered economically. And I think that's quite important to note that there's a toxic link, as we say, between banking risk and sovereign risk. If you, if you follow the crisis, you'll see that when a country has a crisis in, in, in its bond market or with its bonds, uh, banks tend to be the biggest holder of that country's bonds. It impacts on, on your banks and it generates a banking crisis. On the other hand, if a country has a banking crisis, like you saw with Lehman or you saw it, it will generate a sovereign crisis as well. So for that reason, you've got a lot of moral hazard in the system, and governments are often forced to bail out a failing bank, especially a major failing bank, okay? Um, it's easy to say, no, governments shouldn't intervene. But if you don't intervene, the problem is the crisis uh, gets bigger. It, it can impact on the entire economy. So with that in mind, and given this crisis, and after the 1930s, the, the world was almost facing the risk of a Great Depression. As it is with the intervention, I think we certainly prevented a depression. And if you look at someone like Ben Bernanke, who was the Fed governor at the time, uh, had actually been an expert in studying the depression in the 1930s. And uh, fortunately, really, that he was the governor, and in spite of great opposition from the politicians, particularly in the Republican Party, but, you know, generally, people will be asking, why are you saving all these rich guys, all these billionaires, you know, who are linked to banks? Um, why, are you, why, why are you saving them? Why are you putting taxpayers' money up to, to save these banks? Uh, which, which is an understandable perspective. Okay. So coming from that, let me move faster then, that obviously as South Africa, we were in the process of reforming our system. We had our fair share of banking crisis, uh, but we also started having a problem with Fidentia. And the minister at the time, Trevor Manuel, asked us to re-look at our regulatory system. And we were actually at work before the crisis trying to see how could we improve the system. This um, and then the crisis starts, and we kind of hold back because the reforms that we had, we realized, were actually not going far enough. And we then um, uh, used the fact that because South Africa didn't have a financial crisis compared to, say, the US and uh, Europe, um, we, we actually were able to develop a policy document we started going to forums like the Financial Stability Board, which at that time was chaired by Mario Draghi. It's a multilateral institution that brings in the, the most uh, important financial centers of the world. Um, and they started by looking at the banking crisis, but then began to expand to look at other parts of the financial sector as well. Because there's lots of inter interlinkages uh, between financial institutions and if you look in the US, uh, they also had a crisis because they had what's called a monoline insurer that also went bust 
and the authorities had to intervene. So it wasn't just a banking crisis, it became a crisis for certain types of insurance. So what happened was by 2011, we had developed a document and we had decided that aside from looking at, at the, uh, on one hand, we had to look at financial stability from a macro perspective, that that, uh, that, that was an objective which needed to be done uh, explicitly in any country. You know, if you look at our constitution, there's no reference to financial stability. So what we had to do was to then empower the South African Reserve Bank to also ensure that uh, aside from monetary policy uh, and price stability, that they also looked at financial stability. The tools were not there, the laws were not all in place, but the Saab the Reserve Bank was able to oversee that there was that our financial stability was maintained during the crisis and after. But we also realized that our financial institutions, and, and this became the words of the IMF, that they need to be regulated more, and the words were inten intrusively, intensively, and effectively. Okay, so it's, it was quite a paradigm shift from before 2008, where now the word was that you had to be very intrusive um, in you, the way you regulate or supervise a financial institution. So the question you can ask Kuben when he comes on is, uh, were they intrusive enough with VBS long beforehand? Okay. Uh, if not, why not? Okay. These are all important questions even for the Saab, for the Treasury to understand. Because we need to say, though we're not responsible for the initial crime or negligence, it's quite important from a systems perspective that our, our supervisors, and I, and I use the word regulators and supervisors, okay, regulators, you set the rules, but you also need to supervise that the rules are actually being enforced. So I heard Kuben this morning saying, well, with VBS, they were giving their monthly returns, they were being interrogated. But those uh, submissions also had to be signed off by auditors. And in this instance, it appears like the auditors deliberately uh, not just looked the other way, but helped to ensure that, that uh, 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 the, that the submissions actually, to put it bluntly, lied, okay? Uh, uh, said that there was more money in the, in the bank than there actually was. And so the Saab has to place reliance on auditors. Not something that I think uh, before all the recent scandals that, that we would have anticipated. We thought that we had a very sound auditing system. If you look at some of the world measures, um, uh, doing business in South Africa, for example, we got rated number one for the quality of auditing that was done in South Africa. Now, there are problems and, and major problems with the audit profession, as we've learned. But coming back to what we did was we realized that if you look at the financial sector, we needed to create a prudential authority. Um, uh, and, and we had, before that, a, bank, a banking regulator, which was just the bank supervision department in the Reserve Bank, and a non-banking regulator, which was the Financial Services Board. What we then had did was we created one prudential regulator and we put them into the Reserve Bank. This has taken effect from the 1st of April this year. It took many years to get the laws passed. But importantly, we also created a market conduct regulator. Now, market conduct regulator, basically the rationale is we're saying the financial sector holds, if you compare the power of the consumer versus the, uh, of the banks over their consumers or their customers, it's clearly asymmetric. If you have a problem with your bank, your bank can just play with lawyers and just uh, string you along and really um, you, you don't have much power. So from a consumer uh, protection perspective, you expect financial institutions to have higher standards than normal consumer protection legislation 
to make sure that they're treating their customers fairly. And that's why in the system, we have a system of how they need to handle complaints from customers. And if that system fails, you have an ombud system so that you don't have to get expensive lawyers, so that the customer can get seek recourse should there be something uh, that or they've not been dealt with fairly. But market conduct goes beyond consumer protection. It also goes into how does a financial institution conduct its business. So if you look at the situation, uh, many of you will have cars. You might not own a house yet, okay? But your car would be insured. I don't know if you've looked at the insurance policies on your cars. Um, if you take you and the person next to you, and you, and you both have car insurance, you'll find that uh, you, you can't even compare the two products. It's very difficult to compare products. Um, uh, and, and so we've taken on the financial sector to say, you can't come up with such complex products. In fact, the pro products are designed to confuse. Okay, and it's designed for you to feel that you are too stupid to know. What's the difference between two simple car insurance products? Now, I promise you, as customers, you need to be pretty militant or aggressive customers. Don't ever let any institution tell you that you are too stupid to ask and you just don't understand. The stupid questions are the best questions to ask the institution. And in fact, when we've looked into these areas, and Andrew, I suppose I should be coming to an end, let me just leave you with, you know, we've been looking at the area of retirement reform. We've been looking at the cost structure uh, in your retirement funds. And you look at certain models, you'll find that at the end of the day, a person, say, has worked, if you look at an old model, say, 40, 45 years, stuck in one product, uh, that they would, you, you, you could find that the system of annual charges can swallow up, in theory, up to 40% of the potential uh, returns that you could have had uh, when you retire. And this is all done quietly. Uh, they weren't very transparent and so on. So I think I'll leave it at that. There isn't that much time. Uh, I'll leave it to Kuben. So just to say, we've brought in the Twin Peaks system. We look at financial stability. We've now got two regulators, the Prudential Authority and the Reserve Bank, and the Financial Services Board has now morphed into the Financial Sector Conduct Authority, which then looks at market conduct. And this has meant, for example, that people who were dealing with insurance on the prudential side in the FSB all moved over to the SAAB. But if they're doing market conduct, they remain in the Conduct Authority. So you've got two regulators now watching over the uh, financial institutions. It's a very exciting development. Uh, Maybe we've gone too far, who knows? Uh, because people will say, from light touch, you've gone to very heavy touch. But the approach that you do take is that you, there's a place for more intrusive and intensive regulation. How that actually uh, works in practice, I think, is a challenge that we're going to have to look at. So thank you very much.